Good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is also my pleasure to uh, welcome you here uh, this morning for, uh, uh, in fact, what it is the fourth security day that we are uh, organizing, uh, organizing this year. And I would like at the outset to warmly welcome uh, uh, all of you as participants, but in particular uh, the panelists and the moderators. Uh, I think we have uh, a very distinguished, very experienced uh, uh, group of, uh, uh, of participants uh, that uh, will share with us uh, their knowledge, their experiences. I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing from you your considerations, your recommendations, the lessons learned uh, that you would like to uh, share with us. And I hope that that will be uh, uh, the beginning of a good uh, uh, debate uh, with, the, uh, with the audience. Uh, of course, in the OSC, we, we are coming from an important ministerial uh, decision a couple of years ago uh, on the conflict cycle, and we've been uh, uh, focusing increasingly on uh, how to improve uh, our toolbox, uh, how to improve the procedures, uh, and, and to see how we can uh, uh, step up uh, our engagement on the ground in relation to uh, specific issues uh, we, are, we are dealing with. Uh, of course, uh, Conflict resolution, in a way, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, a daily occurrence in the OSC. That's, that's what we do, and we do it in, a, in many different ways. If you look back, and if you look back at the agenda for peace uh, uh, of, uh, of the Secretary General of the UN, and the debate that ensued from that uh, in, the, in the UN, uh, you, you realize a number, a number of things. You realize, first of all, how broad uh, is, is, in fact, uh, peacekeeping and the issues related to, uh, uh, to conflict resolution. And, and the OSC is engaged on many segments of that, uh, uh, of that agenda. But secondly, you see how much it has evolved, and the Brahimi report, and, uh, and uh, uh, responsibility to protect, and, and whatever uh, coming up uh, uh, in, in the debate in the, in the UN. Um, and these are things that have uh, had constantly an impact uh, on the agenda of the organization. And I'm looking that also from my own pro professional, uh, 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 in a way, uh, experiences, having served in different places and different functions, but always having come across from different angles, if you want, uh, with aspects of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, large, large issue. Now, the, the OSC, the OSC, uh, has been long involved in conflict resolution efforts. Some of these have been dragging on for a very long time. Uh, and of course, this is a situation that we're not comfortable with. But sometimes, this is just what we get and how far, uh, how far we, uh, uh, we, can, uh, um, uh, we can go uh, uh, given the circumstances on the ground. So for us, uh, I would say an imperative is, uh, is always, the first imperative is to engage and to try through our engagement to promote stability, uh, uh, which can be a short-term stability while searching for uh, a long-term solution of the conflicts. But of course, the, the short-term, if the ingredients are not there for the long-term solution, then becomes the kind of a standard situation. And, uh, and that's uh, uh, what we are confronted with in a, in a number of areas. Uh, and, and this, you know, applies to uh, whatever, to Nagorno-Karabakh as to the 5 plus 2 in, uh, uh, in Moldova uh, or, or the Geneva negotiations on, on Georgia. In, in this moment, we are uh, also very actively uh, involved in another uh, uh, dossier, which is the organization of municipal elections in northern Kosovo and the issue of uh, also uh, uh, voting from uh, Serbia, voters from Serbia. Uh, voting for the Kosovo municipal elections. And that, of course, is not uh, an administrative function for the organization. This is, again, part of uh, a larger conflict resolution effort in that area by the international community where the OSC uh, has taken on a, a role for, uh, uh, for itself. Uh, less visible, perhaps, to the public, but equally important uh, in terms of conflict resolution for the OSC uh, is the effort of uh, quiet diplomacy and facilitation of dialogue uh, at local and national level uh, uh, in particular that of the High Commission of National Minorities, which is critical to preventing uh, or reducing tensions between groups, promoting tolerance and finding solutions for conflicts before they escalate or re-escalate into, into violence. Uh, verification monitoring by field operations, of course the field operations are one of the key tools for us uh, to, uh, to operate in, these, in this context. Uh, our important OSC contribution to, to conflict resolution and peacekeeping 
as the efforts by mission members engage in capacity building in areas such as rule of law, human rights, disarmament, democratization, and security sector reform, just to uh, mention uh, some of them. And, and certainly the activities uh, uh, of the OSC throughout its field operations remain uh, relevant today as they were in the 90s in, in Southeast Europe, for instance. Um, a couple of general considerations uh, to um, help our discussions uh, go hopefully beyond already well-known national positions and specific protracted conflicts. Uh, conflict resolution should be perceived as uh, a multi-track process. Uh, that relies on a wide range of methods and procedures aimed at peaceful and sustainable solution to conflict issues. Preparing a state and its people for peace, including through building bridges and overcoming deep-seated animosities, is as important as a ceasefire, interim of, uh, or final peace agreements, all of which are essential contribution to conflict resolutions. But obviously they are stepping stones along the path, rather the end of the path as such. Conflict res resolution involves uh, uh, long-term long political processes, including periods of slow or no progress, punctuated by shifts in position, circumstances, and, and context. And that's why also uh, the tools that we apply may have to shift and, uh, and, and, and ad adapt uh, over time. And uh, it is important uh, for uh, the, the facilitator to identify and leverage windows of opportunity whenever progress can be made. And of course, to be effective and uh, sustainable approaches to conflict resolution must be comprehensive, but in particular uh, must be tailored to specific needs and strategic interests of the conflicting parties and all the stakeholders uh, involved. Uh, conflict resolution can only be successful if it respects the principle of local ownership and is built on political will and the commitment of the conflicting parties. Uh, without a strong uh, uh, determination by the conflicting parties, no conflict resolution effort can be successful, no matter how effective uh, um, the, the mechanism uh, applied. So I think that remains a key, <coughs> a key condition. At the end of the day, sustainable peace building and long-term non-violent conflict resolution processes will be the more effective, the more they are based on integration of government and civil society approaches across uh, regional, national and local levels. In light of these considerations, I would, uh, uh, I would like to hear your views on uh, um, a number of key issues of importance, uh, in particular to us here in Vienna. How can the OSC increase its capacity to identify and leverage entry points for its efforts in conflict resolution? And how can we further integrate gender-based approach into conflict resolution? How can the organization enhance its contribution as regards facilitation, monitoring, and verification of peace agreements? How can the OSC capitalize on lessons learned from its past performance in civilian peacekeeping? And how can the organization increase its preparedness for participating in future multi multilateral peacekeeping operations? And how can we strengthen our contribution to sustainable peace building, for instance, through the support for local and national conflict resolution mechanisms as part of so-called infrastructure for peace? Uh, as you will have seen, a brief summary paper outlining key recommendations from this security day uh, will be made available to participants in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm convinced that sound recommendations uh, identified today can uh, be highly useful also for our discussions on the conflict cycle, including in the framework of the Helsinki Plus 40 process. Lessons learned and best practices identified today may well feed into our debates on the establishment of a security community within the OSC and promote the organization's capacity in all phases of the conflict cycle. And now, I think I've spoken already too much, I have the pleasure of handing over to our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, William Zartman, Professor Emeritus at the Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins uh, University. Professor Zartman, floor is yours. They were testing the public address system and Somebody said, the, the quality is not good. And I said to myself, that depends on the speaker. <clears throat> so I hope to, I'm honored to be here and I hope to bring something of quality to your, not only reflections, but your work. Somebody asked me, your keynote speaker, what's the keynote? <clears throat> and I said, it's middle C. 
Uh, it's the C that you have up there in OSCE of cooperation. But uh, middle C also refers to C in conflict. And so uh, I think what we're interested in is getting from the C of conflict to the C of cooperation that your organization is dedicated to. When we talk about conflict as analysts and the, uh, the ending of conflict, uh, we break it down. Uh, you talk about conflict resolution. We break down the conflict resolution endpoint into two uh, elements. Uh, conflict resolution, which is the elimination of the issues at conflict, and conflict management, which is the demotion of the means of pursuing conflict from violence to uh, politics. A presidential election is a good example of conflict management. We don't shoot each other anymore. We just get elected and accept it. Um, but uh, conflict management is a trap that we don't often recognize. Conflict management contains within itself the promise of conflict resolution. But conflict management also removes the pressure for conflict resolution. If you're not using violence anymore, what's the problem? Why should we keep on going any further if the conflict is just somnolent and, and political? Uh, so the challenge for us is to, uh, is to continue the process from a demotion of the means of conflict to a resolution of the ends of conflict. Conflict resolution then we carry out by simply the three different ways of, of doing it. It breaks down into that with many multiple, with multiple uh, subcategories, either by concessions, cut the orange in half, uh, you get half, I get half, that's necessarily a zero sum uh, type of outcome, what I lose you get and what you lose I get, um, or uh, compensation and practitioners don't often think enough about that, that is how can we buy an acceptable outcome? How can one side buy an acceptable outcome from the other side? Can we bring in other elements? We frequently say, well, wait, wait, don't bring in extraneous elements, focus on the problem, but can we bring in other elements that will compensate for uh, the loss that, uh, uh, that one side uh, makes in regard to the other? Or construction, which we think about even less, that is reframing the, uh, the conflict in such a way that it's of benefit to both sides. There are lots of examples often unrecognized and too many examples not, uh, not looked for. Uh, but in the boundary dispute between Peru and Ecuador where the two sides were armed with international law and each proved its side 100%. You can prove your side 100% by the use of law. Uh, and uh, it, so the two parties never, could never come to an agreement <clears throat> until the mediator said, why, why are you worried about boundaries? Why not think about development? That's something that's of interest to both sides. And uh, this region in northern Peru and in eastern Ecuador is an area that's underdeveloped and can only be developed by cooperating together. They re reframed the conflict in terms of a goal that was of interest to both sides. Parties who are looking for a conflict resolution have to con think continually about what the alternatives are. Uh, we talk about why are all these conflicts out there and they're not, uh, not resolved? Why are we stuck in intractable conflict? I think the answer is very clear. It's because the alternatives are worse than the conflict in which one finds oneself. I often talk about the, what I call the S5 situation, a soft, stable, self-serving stalemate. How many conflicts find themselves in an S5 situation where the alternative uh, is, uh, is worse than uh, uh, what we're suffering at the, at the present time? And we think about uh, alternatives in a bad sense even more than in a good sense. Uh, theory and uh, social psychology tells us that we're more concerned about losses than we are about gains. We want to protect ourselves against losses. So in the Western Sahara, the two sides don't come to an agreement because they're afraid that the other side might uh, win the outcome and that would be a greater loss from them, for them than is the present situation of ongoing conflict, just like in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is closer home to you. Well, these are all ideas about how to achieve a conflict resolution. But there's a question that we often don't look at enough, and that is when. 
Those of us who look at conflict, uh, who analyze conflict mediation and conflict, uh, often come up with the idea you can negotiate anything. You have a conflict, so let's try to find a solution. And we have to face the fact that parties are not interested in, in a solution unless they are impelled by alternatives to get there. That is, unless the situation of the conflict is, and here's the word I've been asked to talk about, ripe. That is, if the conflict is ready, is ripe to be resolved. What is involved in ripeness? Why do parties want to turn their attention to a, a resolution, a management first and then a resolution of a, a conflict? It's because they find themselves, first of all, in a mutually hurting stalemate. That is, they're stalemated. They can't get to the solution that they want unilaterally because of what the other side is doing. It's blocking them. And the, that is a reciprocal type of action. So it's a mutual stalemate. But more important, after all, how many, stalemate, how many people here are involved in some kind of stalemate that you don't like, but uh, we're not spending our time trying to get out of it. But the difference is that we need to be fi find a situation of a mutually hurting stalemate. That is, the parties need to say to themselves, it can't go on like this. This stalemate in which we're caught uh, makes us uh, suffer, uh, and therefore we should uh, start looking for a solution that involves the other side, some kind of acceptance of me negotiation between the two parties, or uh, acceptance of mediation if we can't find an outcome ourselves. So there are a number of elements elements that are involved in this then, uh, four of them. First of all, this element of the stalemate. Second of all, the element of pain, a pain that, uh, uh, that the pain of, of continuing loss or even prospective loss that uh, outweighs any gain that we might have by continuing uh, into the, uh, the conflict. Um, uh, parties also must be able to see as the second element of ripeness uh, a way out, not a particular way out, but must sense that with the other party we can find a solution. The other party, it's a kind, again a reciprocal feeling, that with the, uh, the other party feels that we can help them find a way out of, out of the problem and we feel that they can help us find a way out of the problem, that we're both caught in this stalemate and we want to find uh, a way out of it uh, that's of benefit uh, to all of us. Uh, and then again, this element of, of pain, that the pain is something that uh, we feel we can't stand or, or we, can't, uh, uh, we can't argue away. There are plenty of reasons why we refuse to feel pain. No pain without gain. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, the loss is something that we could bear because the cause is so great. And so there are lots of countries, there are lots of people that find themselves in a situation of pain uh, that they won't admit or that they're inoculated uh, against. How many situations do we know? Look at the Middle East, uh, where the element of pain between Israel and the Palestinians has become part of the national myth. It hurts us the way we're being treated by the other side, but it's for a good cause. And uh, tomorrow, Jerusalem, we say, on both sides, uh, we can swallow up that pain. The point is, uh, I think, out of this understanding of what is ripe for the beginning of a search for a solution is that it is a perceptional element. The uh, element of ripeness is not an objective element. It, is, does, it doesn't exist unless it's perceived, unless it's felt subjectively. You can tell the parties, uh, uh, don't you see, you're losing, uh, you're in an awful situation, it's hurting your economy and so on, but if the party doesn't feel that or feels that the pain is worth it, uh, then we're not in a mutually hurting stalemate. The situation is, is not right. The same thing is true of the way out. It is an, a perceptional, not a, an objective situation. If you see that the other party is, you think that the other party is ready to help you find a solution to its benefit as well as yours to come to some kind of an agreement, then it's there. And if you don't see it, uh, then uh, it doesn't exist. 
Perceptions are very important. We deal with them. Perceptions are what defines reality. We talk about objective situations, but unless we perceive these situations, they don't take place. And perceptions are what is important to the role of the diplomat in uh, working with a mutually hurting stalemate. If things were only objective, without any concern about the perceptions, then we'd be stuck. Parties would have to have costs imposed on them from the outside. But what the work of the practitioner or the diplomat can do is to help the parties perceive that they are caught in a situation. The objective situation, of course, matters. If you have some objective element to point to, uh, then the development of a perception is much easier. But the work of the diplomat is to develop that perception. And so we say, what if the situation is not right? What if the parties don't feel themselves caught in a mutually hurting stalemate with a way out? The answer is not to give up and go home and wait for another day. If to you as a mediator, a, a, a conciliator, a cooperation seeker, uh, the uh, solution is worthwhile, the answer is to ripen that is to help uh, develop the perception that this situation uh, cannot go on. Um, I, I, I don't want to dismiss the objective elements. If we look at the situation in Cyprus, uh, back at the time of, of Kofi Annan and, and Alvaro de Soto, uh, the situation in the beginning was perfectly a perfect example of a mutually hurting stalemate. Uh, when the entry of Cyprus into the European Union was preconditioned on a solution of the internal problem. That was a, an objective element that the parties, uh, that it was easy to make the parties see uh, as a basis for a mutually hurting stalemate. And then the EU lifted that precondition and the objective element was not there anymore and the situation was simply, had simply lost the ripeness that it had. But in many cases we can point to things of, of uh, uh, objective loss, costs of the conflict, uh, inability to, uh, to arrive at a solution that's favorable to one side or to the other, and there is work to be done uh, in, in uh, heightening the perception of the parties to uh, uh, the situation in which they find themselves. Does this guarantee a, 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 a successful outcome? No. The situation of ripeness is a, a necessary but not sufficient condition for the beginning of the search for, uh, for a solution. Necessary because as I've developed it, the parties have to feel that the alternative in which they find themselves is, is not acceptable. It's not sufficient, the situation of ripeness has to be seized, has to be cultivated, has to be developed. And that's the work of the, of the diplomats, of the politicians, of the people, and of the analysts helping them as well to perceive this, this, uh, this uh, situation. Um, it also means that once the negotiations have started, the mediation has begun, this idea of pressure uh, to keep on uh, looking for a solution has to be maintained. We can't say, oh, the, the situation is, uh, the negotiations have begun, mediation has started, the parties are talking about cooperation, so we don't have to worry anymore uh, about their motives into the, into the uh, search for an outcome. The parties have to continually feel themselves, be reminded if necessary, uh, that that alternative exists, that if the negotiations do not come out uh, right, then uh, the parties go back to facing themselves uh, and each other in a mutually hurting stalemate. I don't like this. It's uncomfortable. It means that brinkmanship is the, uh, is the father of solutions. It means that we have to make sure that the parties feel pain in order to come to some positive outcome. And so we may ask ourselves, well, doesn't the other side work? Why don't we say, look at the gain you're going to make. Uh, and uh, uh, why don't you look ahead at the, at the positive side? Why don't you look for a mutually enticing opportunity instead of a mutually hurting stalemate? And that would be nice, but it doesn't work. 
We just can't find, a, except, some, except for a couple exceptions that, that we can all think about. Whenever anybody tells you a general rule, then you all immediately can think of an exception. Except for the exceptions that we might think about, uh, that is not the path to uh, beginning negotiations. It is the, we only do things that we have to do, and it is the pressure of that stalemate that, uh, uh, that makes us look for uh, uh, negotiated outcomes and cooperation. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, kilometer 101 in 1973, where the two sides were locked in a mutually hurting stalemate, Israel and, and Egypt, <coughs> and the talks on withdrawal began. I'm talking about Namibia, where for six, or then Southwest Africa, where for six years uh, the parties <coughs> were not interested in uh, listening to the other side because they had troops in uh, the Namibian Angolan uh, territory because the other side had troops. Namib uh, Angola had uh, Cubans and South Africa uh, had its troops uh, in there. Uh, and it was not until they uh, found themselves in 1986 in a series of battles that ended in stalemates and they brought home body bags of their own citizens that they said, maybe we're stuck in here in something that we don't want to pursue. Uh, I'm thinking of Aceh, uh, which was difficult to, uh, to uh, uh, resolve until the good Lord, thank you, sent a tsunami and pushed us to some kind of cooperation, uh, pushed the parties to some kind of cooperation together. I'm talking, as I said, about Cyprus uh, before uh, the precondition was, uh, was raised. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the uh, situation in uh, uh, Dayton uh, in the negotiation over, over Bosnia. But I'm also talking about the FCCC. I'm talking about not necessarily, not only violent conflicts, but conflicts that are conflicts against nature, conflicts against interpretations of parties of the situation in which they find themselves. Conflicts in which the hurt is uh, foreseeable in the future, not at the present time. And you know that in the Kyoto negotiations and what comes afterward, some of the parties don't feel that they're hurting enough now in order to come to some kind of an agreement. They don't find themselves in a, a stalemate. So uh, uh, the idea of ripeness is a, is a negative, is a painful idea something that impels us to find solutions. And it's also one that can't be used as an excuse for inaction. The challenge is out there, and it's a challenge that takes more time from diplomats uh, than the actual solution of the problem itself. That is the challenge of ripening the perception. Thank you. So we begin now uh, with the first, uh, uh, the first panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, from my left, uh, Ambassador Frederick Tanner, 
uh, Professor Terence Hopman and uh, uh, Catherine Wollard, Executive Director of European Peacekeeping Liaison Officer. But I will uh, introduce the speakers uh, uh, better one by one as they, as they intervene. Um, following the, the very insightful and uh, thought-provoking keynote speech by Professor Chartman, uh, so we'll uh, now plunge into, into the debate. But I would like, uh, already at the outset, uh, to uh, uh, keep in mind this keynote speech, which was uh, inspiring in many ways. And I would like, as, uh, as you uh, will interact with the panel, uh, to offer you the possibility also to ask questions uh, of Professor uh, Hartmann, who is sitting here in front of me, and he will be ready also to, uh, uh, to come in, in in our discussion and, uh, and uh, uh, react to your comments or answer your questions also from, from his seat. So this is virtually a, a, a four-people uh, uh, panel. Um, uh, let me also point out at the outset uh, that this first session uh, will be open to the media and will, will be uh, web streamed uh, live. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, for also for the debate. Uh, following this, then we will uh, close the doors and the rest of the discussion uh, will uh, uh, continue under Chatham House rules. Um, this panel specifically will look into the conceptual and practical approaches to conflict resolution in the uh, OSC area. Uh, Cross-dimensional issues will be examined along with the specific contribution of female actors and the role of women in conflict resolution. And we will also explore what kind of conflict resolution work should be taken forward by the OSC in order to uh, make best use of the comparative advantage of this uh, organization vis-a-vis -vis other uh, international uh, actors. So I would uh, uh, not uh, uh, continue a long introduction. I would uh, uh, pass the floor to, uh, uh, to the speakers, uh, uh, inviting them to be uh, as concise as possible in their uh, initial remarks, and then looking forward to, uh, uh, to a good interaction uh, with the audience. Um, first panelist uh, uh, is our good friend, Ambassador uh, Fred Tanner, the, the former director of the Geneva Center for Security uh, Policy. Uh, since the beginning of September, uh, he is also assisting us in the Secretariat uh, as, uh, as a senior advisor. Uh, he serves also as a focal point within the Secretariat for uh, the academic network. And of course, he will act as liaison for the uh, 2014 Swiss chairmanship uh, of the OSCE. Uh, throughout his remarkable career, Ambassador Tanner has held uh, numerous teaching and research positions in eminent universities and academic institutions, and is a member also of the United Nations Secretary General's Advisory Body on Disarmament Matters and serves on the Transatlantic Task Force of German uh, Marshall Fund. So, um, as I uh, give you the floor, Fred, uh, I, uh, can, you, can you tell us as you see conflict resolution as a process and, uh, uh, as a pro and, and what are the factors of effectiveness to sustainability relating to this, uh, to this process, especially from the perspective of the OSC, which, uh, which you just, uh, you're just joining in a sense uh, from, from your perspective. Fred. Thank you, uh, uh, Secretary General. Thank you, Lamberto. Uh, it's actually a privilege, a huge privilege, but also slightly intimidating to, to be here with uh, the Secretary General. My, my new uh, 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 boss, and so I think uh, it's, it's, it's for me a very special situation to, to briefly talk about conflict management um, with regard to the OACE. And here, I'd just like to come back briefly to the notion of the S5 by uh, Professor Sartman. When we look at the, the various protected uh, conflict areas within the OACE, we realize actually that they have been here for a very long time actually for about 20 years. And this means that in these regions, a new generation has been emerging, growing up. We have people there uh, in their 20s and 30s who know nothing about, uh, who only know uh, division, underdevelopment, no mobility, often no dignity, and no freedom from fear. Even the soldiers and defense forces who are deployed to these dividing lines probably were just about born when these conflicts were frozen. They all do not remember a world free of contact lines, 
a world free of diversity and cross communal and cross border cooperation exchange. It was uh, Timothy Gordon Ash, a uh, historian who, who recently uh, wrote about the importance of collective memory for Europe and for its security. And the same way we could argue that we have to cater memory for the societies and groups living in the protected conflict area that highlights more the uh, OEC principles and value sets rather than division, separatism, and zero-sum uh, relationships. Here, I'd like to briefly uh, develop uh, three points. First, we know, uh, particularly also through the 2011 World uh, Development Report, but many scholarly work before that, that about 90% of recent civil wars have occurred in countries that had a war in the last 20 to 30 years. That means that the OEC should conceptually and operationally address the protected uh, conflicts also from much more from a conflict prevention perspective and apply OECE conflict prevention tool sets to this region. In this context, as the Secretary General already mentioned, the ministerial decision uh, 311 of Vilnius, this decision is very precious because it clearly combines the various phases of conflict and provides a basis for cross-dimensional approach to conflict management. The second point is that protected conflict provides human and social and economic burdens on individuals, families, and communities where uh, there's a clearly a link between protracted conflicts and the lack of human development in the concerned regions. In fact, the study uh, showed uh, that protracted conflicts in the OECE and worldwide do constitute the major obstacles to the achievement of the millennium, millennium Development Goals as these regions have been thrown back by about 30 years in their economic uh, development. My third point is that protected conflicts areas provide a high propensity of non-conflict armed violence, giving space to organized crime and social unrest and provide um, groups in societies as easy prey to radical nationalism. We talk about youth unemployment, concentration of displayed populations, women and children, all are exposed to a fragile post-conflict region, but a region where the stalemate seems not to be hurting enough to have a strategic settlement. In this context, let me now come back to a couple of uh, recommendations with regard to the process which should be uh, engaged. Uh, and uh, the first one I'd like uh, to briefly uh, look at is, of course, local ownership, to work more with the concerned societies and groups. Actually, the easy report made some very good recommendation in this field to uh, pursue capacity development with uh, these concerned uh, populations. Um, also, to engage uh, non-governmental organizations, work with churches, academic and scientific institutions, and, and non-governmental organizations. And of course, the training and capacity building are essential tools in this uh, conflict prevention approach. There is a lot of training going on within the UAC area. It would be useful to have more training concept templates for the field missions to hook up with regional and global initiatives with the UN, European Union, other organizations, which do now have more and more based on their rosters for civilian capacities, uh, training activities, where the OSC is certainly part of it. We know that the OSC embarks on mediation uh, training, setting up mediation support unit, and, and here also that, of course, should be fed into the field uh, missions. Uh, it's important to tap more into the national conflict prevention capacities of participating states. Uh, I think something with a lot of potential which bring the states in as much as bringing international organizations into these efforts to have capacity in conflict management and conflict uh, resolution. My second last point is that we need also to have a better knowledge about the conflict situations in the region. This has been uh, actually very much highlighted by the ministerial decision 311, 
which has participated in states for better information exchange and risk assessments. We, of course, know this is debate in the, in the permanent council. Also, the FSC uh, can be, of course, an important uh, tool here, uh, as the Vienna document has a chapter that de dedicated to risk reduction. But uh, I think we need more analytical capabilities within UAC executive structures. Uh, here, actually, the Helsinki summit of 1992 suggested to fall back on independent advice and counsel from relevant experts, institutions, and international organizations. And uh, the Secretary General already mentioned, of course, the creation of this academic network of think tanks and institutions. And that certainly could also be uh, involved more in risk, political risk analysis. Then finally, my last point is, of course, more on a strategic level. Um, again, uh, MC311 uh, provided the Secretariat with more power. Uh, this power can only be exercised if the space is given to, to do that, being that with regard uh, to uh, good offices, uh, with regard to certain uh, initiatives, uh, or as the Secretary, Secretary General has mentioned beginning, to have entry points, to find the right entry points into uh, conflict solving. But for all that, as we know, the organization is very much a decentralized organization. We should look probably at some kind of whole of, whole of system approach to make conflict management more effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Um, a second panelist uh, is also a long-standing friend of the OSC, Professor Terence Hopman. He is currently Director of Conflict Management Program at the Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University. But before joining uh, Johns Hopkins, he had already been teaching at a number of outstanding academic institutions, such as Brown University, where he was, among others, Director of the Global Security Program former editor of the International Studies Quarterly. Professor Hopman is an expert uh, scholar in the field of conflict resolution and has extensively worked on the OSCE. So, Professor, the OSCE role in conflict resolution, uh, w w what do you see as the comparative advantages? And we have lots of discussions ourselves on, uh, about this, uh, of the OSCE vis-a-vis -vis other international actors and stakeholders and where the weaknesses are. Uh, well, that's also what we're interested in to hear from, uh, from uh, a scholar who's uh, so familiar with the OSC. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. I'm very pleased to be here this morning to uh, speak to such a distinguished audience. And I come, again, as someone from the academic world uh, who has spent uh, now uh, almost 40 years uh, looking at the development and evolution of this organization, uh, going back to Geneva in 1974 when I was the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace there, uh, and interviewed uh, many of the delegates who negotiated the Helsinki Final Act, right. uh, up through, of course, uh, the whole series, particularly of conferences that have taken place, and, and, and uh, looking at uh, a number of the field missions and so forth uh, that have developed over the last 20 years. So my main focus, in some sense, is going to be today on, on, on what can the academic community contribute to OSCE, and what can we learn as scholars, but also as practitioners uh, from the experience of the OSCE. Uh, to begin with, I think it's really important to emphasize that the OSCE is quite unique, I think. In, in some sense, it's a very radical normative institution. Uh, it's based upon a series of rather radical statements that go back to the Helsinki Decalogue um, about the nature of international relations, which if taken seriously, I think, would very much uh, change the way in which we think about international relations compared to the kind of traditional models that uh, came out of, out of Westphalia in 1648 or the Congress of Vienna of, of, of 1815, where uh, international relations was based largely upon the absolute sovereignty of states in the competitive and anarchic world, uh, competing with one another primarily through the use of power. Uh, this is an institution that has attempted to develop a normative framework and a normative framework which emphasizes a dialogue, uh, peace building, uh, and cooperation in uh, trying to build, I think, at least the potential for what uh, the famous Czech-German-American uh, political scientist Karl Deutsch called a security community, a pluralistic security community, or a no-war community, a community where the idea that conflicts are settled through violence and war simply becomes unthinkable 
uh, and where we have both the institutional framework and the normative framework for trying to develop uh, peaceful, nonviolent solutions uh, to the problems which we encounter. And this developed, of course, through the Helsinki Decalogue of 10 principles, none of which is superior to the others. These are all equally important principles, and they interact with one another, uh, but they cannot be prioritized. We cannot say that one principle, the territorial integrity of states, for example, supersedes all other principles. A point I'll emphasize again in just a moment. Uh, and then uh, at, at Paris and Copenhagen, we began to institutionalize this process, created the Conflict Prevention Center, the Missions of Long Duration, the High Commissioner on National Minorities, and the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. But I'd particularly like, in the normative sense, to call attention to the Moscow document of 1991, which I think in some sense made perhaps the most radical statement um, about security in this region, in which the participating states declared, quote, categorically and irrevocably, I repeat, irrevocably, that commitments undertaken in the field of the human dimension of the CSCE are matters of direct and legitimate concern of all participating states and do not belong exclusively to the internal affairs of the state concerned. That is, in some sense, when states have freely subscribed to a set of normative principles, all of the participating states have a kind of droit de rigueur to see to it that these principles are implemented. And this has been, I think, the major goal of this institution, but it has also been, of course, a major struggle that it has faced, because this naturally comes with considerable resistance, frankly, from uh, many states and governments uh, who are reluctant to give up the concept of the absolute nature of sovereignty, uh, even though I think by the 21st century, again, it is time to get beyond the notion that absolute sovereignty supersedes everything uh, and that the territorial integrity of states uh, supersedes all other principles of international relations. But one of the other things that I've observed certainly uh, as the CSCE and OSCE have developed since 1975 uh, is that, uh, at least in the academic area, um, we've done a lot of research on various efforts in conflict management and conflict resolution, uh, a number of which were mentioned by my colleague and friend and predecessor, Bill Zartman, uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, but not all of this research has sort of penetrated into the practice of, of diplomacy uh, in the OSCE or in many other inst international institutions, for that matter. Uh, we, doubt, we now do know some things, even from the OSCE experience, about what works and what doesn't work in trying to resolve conflicts and bring peace uh, within the region. Uh, and we have, I think, an enlarged toolkit available to us uh, that particularly focuses on all of the stages of the conflict cycle. And I'm really pleased to see that the Conflict Prevention Center is beginning to focus on all of the stages of the conflict cycle, each of which require different sets of tools that need to be adapted to the specific circumstances, but where we need to understand uh, where we are in the conflict cycle uh, and how to manage conflict at various stages from the prevention of conflicts turning violent in the first place the management of escalation, especially crisis management, negotiation of ceasefires and the termination of ongoing violent conflicts, peacekeeping, uh, the resolution of the underlying causes of conflict where possible, and even more difficult but nonetheless desirable, reconciliation among parties who have been engaged in conflict, and finally, of course, post-conflict reconstruction, stabilization, and peace building uh, in the aftermath of violent conflict. Uh, the OSCE is unique in the sense that it has embraced all of these different stages, but I, I'm, I'm afraid that at least little of the research that's been done on this has yet to make its way actively into a lot of the practice of diplomacy. And I think we need to better train, we need to better dialogue between the academic world and the practitioners uh, in order to try to strengthen the conceptual and intellectual capacity of people engaged in the actual efforts to deal with conflicts, uh, to learn from the best research. Again, we don't have all the answers clearly in the academic world and don't claim to. Uh, but on the other hand, the notion that sort of diplomats are born uh, and don't need to develop any skills or training or whatever uh, is a bit like saying, you know, I mean, 
medical doctors are born, so they don't need to do research or to look at the latest research in, in their field. But who among us would go to a doctor for a serious illness uh, who had never read any of the current research on cures for cancer or whatever, uh, who is unfamiliar with the tools that are available for dealing with major medical problems? I don't think anyone would consider doing that. And yet a lot of us have no problem, it seems, with going out into the world of conflict where a lot of people are getting killed or are endangered of getting killed or suffering greatly uh, without examining the research that may at least give us some help in trying to figure out uh, how to deal with conflicts uh, in, their, in their various stages. So the OSCE over 40 years, or almost 40 years now as we are approaching Helsinki plus 40, uh, has gained a lot of experience in conflict management. Uh, but what we really need to do now, and what I'm certainly trying to do in my work, and I hope others will as well, uh, is to try to see what lessons we can learn from this experience of the past 40 years uh, that will help us. In this respect, I think the OSCE does have several distinct advantages that it needs to build on. Uh, one is its inclusivity. Inclusivity in at least two different ways. One is its geographic inclusivity. This is still the only major security organization at the regional level, outside of the United Nations, in which Russia, the United States, and the European Union are represented. Since those parties are involved in one way or another in virtually all of the conflicts that the OSCE has dealt with, all three of those parties need to be part of the solution uh, because they are, in some sense, part of the problem. Uh, and this is the only institution, not the European Union, frankly, uh, because it's missing two of those parties. Uh, not NATO, because it's missing one of those parties. Uh, this is the only institution that really has the capacity to deal with the kinds of conflict issues that involve uh, all of the states of Europe, from Vancouver to Vladivostok, uh, the long way around. But secondly, and I think this has been the emphasis of the field missions, is inclusivity ranging from the, the high diplomatic level that takes place in this room and other rooms in the Hofburg, but also down to the work of field offices, particularly many of the regional field offices in the missions for long duration. Um, I think there's been a tendency recently to put the OSCE under pressure to reduce the number of field offices, to concentrate everything in national capitals, but this will reduce the ability to make contact with the grassroots, where the conflicts begin. Uh, where the conflicts are felt most seriously. And uh, one of the most valuable contributions, certainly, that this organization has made has been in the many field offices that over a long period of time keep track of what's going on and are able to work with, in, in many cases, resolve conflicts that don't make the pages of the major newspapers, that don't make the major news stories, but to resolve conflicts at the local level, at the grassroots level, uh, before they escalate and become major conflicts. And it's really important, I think, to keep this on the ground approach and to keep it as broad and inclusive as possible uh, at the same time that we try to strengthen institutions here in terms of giving support to those missions, uh, training to those missions. Uh, I know that the Conflict Prevention Center is now developing these various training tools in, in part, um, perhaps similar also to the United Nations recent development of the Mediation Support Service to provide support in mediation and conflict resolution activities of the special representatives of the Secretary General and other international actors on behalf of the UN. Uh, so the OSCE also needs to develop the capacity, I think, uh, to support its, its missions uh, in an effective and long-term way. And indeed, the other major feature of the OSCE is its potential for continuity. Again, the missions of long duration are indeed, for the most part, missions of long duration. The fact that people are on the ground for a long period of time gives them, unless there's too much turnover, which is sometimes happening also, uh, gives the missions at least the capacity to understand the long-term underlying issues of conflict. Uh, conflict management and conflict resolution cannot be done completely by mediators who parachute in from outside, from New York or Vienna or wherever, um, and they're largely unfamiliar with the situation on the ground and don't have the local contacts, whether at the government level or particularly at the grassroots level, uh, conflict management and conflict resolution needs to be based upon uh, a deep and solid understanding of what is going on on the ground and in the field. Uh, and again, I think this is one of the strengths of this organization, 
Um, it's a strength, though, that needs to be further strengthened, and certainly uh, we must, I think, resist calls that are coming from many quarters uh, to try to uh, reduce these efforts, uh, because I think this really undermines the ability of the organization uh, you know, to fulfill its major goals, and particularly the notion that, uh, as was emphasized at Moscow, and I come back to this, sovereignty is not absolute. When states have freely relinquished some sovereignty to an international organization in order to get something in return. No one gives up sovereignty just for the sake heck of it, but states agree in international institutions to relinquish a little bit of sovereignty to get something in return. And that something is security. That something is peace. Um, and we need to be aware of the fact that when we have these important goals, which the OSCE has articulated in the entire key from Helsinki onward, that it's, it's really essential, I think, you know, to maintain this, this continuous effort, at least, uh, to pursue these efforts on the ground over the long term. And for states to recognize that uh, this is not um, something that's against one state. This is something to help the states in the region develop and strengthen security and avoid problems that are going to potentially undermine development goals, political goals, international integration goals, that are going to be very costly in numerous ways. Uh, and if, if the OSCE is seen and perceived as an institution that can help states deal with problems, both internal and international, then I think uh, we can really begin to get a much fuller uh, realization of the potential contained in the normative foundation upon which this institution is built and which it must not back away from uh, if it's going to continue to play a role in the future comparable to its, its potential and much of which was realized, particularly uh, in the first decade after the end of the Cold War. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our third speaker, last but not least, uh, Catherine Wollard, uh, will address the specific role of women and the valuable contribution of female actors to nonviolent conflict resolution. Since October 2008, Ms. Wollard has been Executive Director of the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office, which is a platform of European NGOs and think tanks committed to peacebuilding and the prevention of violent conflict. Prior to uh, joining this uh, office, she worked on anti-corruption and governance reform, holding, among others, positions Director of Policy, Communications and Comparative Learning, at Conciliation Resources and Senior, uh, um, and Senior Program Coordinator for Southeast Europe, the CIS, and Turkey at Transparency International. Uh, you have the floor, Catherine. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, so in this session, we've been asked to consider the principles and practices that lead to sustainable results in conflict resolution. I would like to pull out one principle and focus on that, and that's inclusiveness. I'm going to cover two main points in my presentation. Firstly, the links between inclusiveness and sustainable results. And secondly, the inclusion of women, uh, which the organizers have asked me to address directly and which I prefer to address within the broader debate on inclusiveness. Uh, I think in the discussion it would be very interesting to hear from participants here about how you feel the OSCE is doing when it comes to inclusive approaches mm -hmm. in peace processes. EPLO, the organization I work for is a network of peacebuilding organizations, and I think we see an underlying set of fundamental principles in peacebuilding work. Many of these have already been discussed by my, the previous uh, interesting presentations from the panelists. Firstly, tackling the root causes of conflict. Secondly, a long-term approach to transform conflict rather than just end violence or manage conflict. Thirdly, a focus on prevention rather than on response. Fourthly, the importance of context, deep understanding of the context in which co conflict takes place. Um, fifthly, the now rather cliched expression, local ownership. Um, finally, conflict sensitivity, including but going beyond do no harm. And then at the end, inclusiveness, which I will focus on now. My understanding of the OSCE's approach is that it fits very much within this framework 
and the principles on which you draw are uh, those similar principles of peace building. However, I think the question always is one of implementation of the principles on which there may be wide consensus. If we look at inclusiveness, I want to look briefly at the what, who, the why, and the how of inclusiveness, and then look at the inclusion of women in particular. Inclusiveness is currently quite a hot topic in peace building, but it's nothing new. It's essentially a reformulation of work that's previously been done under the banner of participation or participatory approaches. The idea being to widen peace processes to include as many societal groups as possible. And that's inclusion at all stages in a peace process. Inclusion in peace negotiations, inclusion in peace agreements, inclusion in post-conflict uh, reconciliation and peace building measures. Inclusion also in terms of those facilitating inclusion of different groups as mediators, for instance, or as negotiators within peace processes. Inclusion is focused a lot on bringing peace constituents to the negotiating table, so going beyond the uh, bearers of weapons. It's focused on including marginalized groups, discriminated against groups, such as minorities and women. And I think much of the debate currently looks at the question of inclusion of civil society as representatives of different groups, but also as links to the wider population. Now, many arguments are made as to why to, meet, uh, to, to, uh, to develop more inclusive peace processes. As in many areas of international affairs, those arguments are both functional and normative. Functional arguments look at the claim that without wide inclusion, there is a risk that different groups undermine uh, peace processes. They may return to violence, for instance, if they're not included. There's an argument now that conflicts are increasingly caused by groups beyond the state, so they need to be part of the solution. There's a question about the quality of peace agreements uh, that are arguably improved by the inclusion of a wider group. Normative arguments tend to be based on justice. Uh, many groups have a right to be included in the peace settlements that will shape their future. In many cases, the, a peace process is an often an opportunity to address historical injustices, for instance, through the redistribution of power. And without wide inclusion, there is a strong risk that a peace agreement will institutionalize and in exacerbate injustices. Um, for instance, criticism has been made of peace agreements, uh, peace agreements, for instance, in Northern Ireland or in Bosnia and Herzegovina that I'm sure are familiar to many here because they focus on certain uh, causes of division, certain ethnic, religious, and sectarian cleavages rather than other bases for discrimination. This is then institutionalized through power sharing arrangements and uh, institution building and could be avoided if the peace agreements themselves had been more inclusive. Perhaps more interesting than the reasons for an inclusive approach are the reasons, uh, the arguments made against this, the obstacles to inclusion, the resistance to it. Uh, these I would summarize as below. There is very strong resistance on the part of governments and armed groups to wider inclusion in peace processes. Uh, states don't like the fact that other groups, civil society groups, are increasingly uh, part of peace processes. Many armed groups negotiators, armed groups themselves, resist the broadening of a peace process. And in my experience, I've met many negotiators for armed groups, for conflicts across the world, uh, very different people, very different organizations. The one thing they all have in common is a very strong hostility towards wider civil society inclusion in peace processes. And second uh, reasons for resistance to inclusion, increasing importance of what I call untouchables, organized criminal groups whose involvement in peace processes is still considered taboo. Uh, wider inclusion uh, would include all of those generating violence, all of those with a stake in building peace, and include these groups that many find difficult to engage. Um, thirdly, a real and perceived lack of civil society capacity to be involved in peace processes and institution building. 
Um, thirdly, a reluctance of external actors to use conditions, incentives or sanctions to promote inclusive peace processes. In some cases, this may be due to a fear of losing influence. Um, and finally, uh, attachment to perhaps simplistic views of peacemaking that focus on a prestige mediator, uh, banging heads together, dealing only with the conflict parties, rather than a more sophisticated understanding of the need for a wide set of multi-track uh, approaches. There are, of course, practical problems. In many cases, widening a peace process may put at risk uh, the, the uh, attempts to reach agreement among the key parties causing violence. Uh, to move to look at the inclusion of women in particular, um, the organisers asked me to consider uh, gender and peace and then the question of women. I think it's very important to distinguish between these two facts. Firstly, gender as an issue in conflict is something rather broader than the narrower topic of women's participation in peace processes. The role and relevance of gender to peace and conflict covers many different issues. It's about understanding the different roles of men and women and the link to violence in particular contexts. It's also about understanding the different impact of conflict on men and women. Uh, so for instance, a question such as, does the conception of masculinity in a particular culture equate masculinity and violence? Is this something that is leading to generating conflict? Is there a link between gender and economic factors? Unemployment among young men is a key conflict risk factor in any context. Are jobs being created perceived as women's work and this, thus not being taken up by those who may be recruited into violent action? Is there a gender dimension to political culture, uh, for instance? Whereas if we focus specifically on the narrow issue of women's inclusion in peace processes, this considers women's involvement in negotiations, in peace agreements, and in implementation of post-conflict institution building. How to do this has focused very much on implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Um, although 1325 in itself covers some of the gender aspects I previously mentioned, a lot of its focus is on how women can be involved in peace processes. Um, our work on 1325 has considered case studies of implementation of 1325 across Europe. In 2010, we prepared a comparative analysis of 21 case studies on how the resolution was being implemented. And we're currently in the process of updating that, looking at the impact of national action plans and other means of implementation. Uh, we base this on our assessment of what makes a good action plan one that has specific actions, allocation of responsibilities, resources, monitoring mechanisms, leadership, uh, somebody who is in charge of implementation. Uh, we see globally there are now 31 plans, 18 of which are in Europe. Of the plans in Europe, five are on to a second phase, having been adapted and improved uh, following assessment. Uh, we've also prepared recommendations on implementation of 1325 and measure progress against these recommendations. I'll just summarize the findings before moving to my conclusions. We see relatively good progress in terms of reporting on the commitments that different organizations and governments have taken on. Uh, there is limited to moderate progress when it comes to implementation in crisis management missions for instance, by putting gender advisors in missions, commitments on gender in mandates and plans for missions. I think this applies also to the OSCE, as well as other international actors. Uh, there is limited progress in appointment of women into senior positions, resources, engaging with civil society, and in adopting minimum standards on implementation of 1325. There's one area where there has been no progress, and that is on participation of women in peace processes, the subject of our discussion here. Our focus at EPLO is the European Union, and there we've seen in the EU's own reporting on its implementation of 1325 that there has been no increase in women's participation in the peace processes that it supports, and no application of conditionality in order to make women's inclusion a condition of support. Um, it would be interesting also to hear the OSCE's experience when it comes to this question. 
Um, to conclude, I think overall we're in a period now of questioning 1325, looking at its impact on peace processes, sees that there have been limited increases in the number of women in peace processes and the number of women deployed as mediators. A number of organizations are questioning the value of 1325 itself. In my view, this would be wrong because the resolution itself is good. If you read the actual original text, it's something I think still extremely useful and pertinent. The difficulty has been in implementation. And there have been, I think, a number of problems in implementing the resolution. One of which is a tendency to over-bureaucratization of the issue and an abstraction away from the original commitments into a whole series of plans, indicators, and so on. In actions, there has been a focus on enabling women to participate through providing support and training. While valuable, I think many women have reached saturation point when it comes to being trained and don't then find that they have access to peace processes despite having uh, been beneficiary of these enabling measure, measures. I think there's also a risk that focusing on training of women to engage in peace processes says that the problem lies with women rather than the power structures that prevent women and exclude them from peace processes. I think there's been a lack of what we might call coercive measures, imposition, if I may call it that, of women into peace processes. Yes, this is extremely sensitive. Uh, but very rarely have external facilitators conditioned their support on the inclusion of women in peace processes. In some cases, they have been included, but simply to talk about women's issues. And this in itself can exacerbate the problem. Um, we argue for inclusion of women as representatives of society, as experts on peace and security, in other capacities than uh, simply to talk about women. In addition, I think there's been an absence of good modeling behavior on the part of international organizations. Many international organizations are heavily male-dominated, particularly at management level, and particularly in conflict contexts. And this does lead to perpetuation of gender stereotypes and can have negative effects on gender relations in conflict-affected countries. And I would draw to your attention the case of Kosovo, where the international community has very rarely had women in senior management positions. And certainly those working on gender in the country would argue that this has had a negative effect on gender relations there. Um, finally, we've seen a certain segregation of the issue, which I feel is not always helpful. It should be part of the wider debate on inclusiveness. Women are one group among many that may be discriminated against and may need to be brought into peace processes. Um, and of course, there is a certain resistance to including women on the part of other parties. Uh, I mentioned the resistance of armed groups uh, to inclusion, wider inclusion in peace processes. Participation in a peace process is a position of power. Those who hold power resist others coming in. Uh, mediation, being a mediator is also a position of power. It's understandable that those holding the power may resist uh, wider inclusion of different groups. So, uh, I think there, from my side, it would be very interesting, as I said, to hear from you how the OSCE is doing when it comes to these questions of inclusiveness in peace processes and what you would see as the obstacles to wider inclusiveness when it comes to the OSCE's actions in this area. The principles it set out certainly are very much in line with taking this wider inclusive approach. Thank you, Ms. Wollard. I think this concludes the presentations from, uh, from the panel, and now the floor is open for uh, questions and comments. And perhaps I could start with one myself, as you are uh, uh, preparing for the, for the debate. And uh, I would like to start uh, from uh, Professor Tsartnow's uh, reference to uh, uh, the S S5 situation, I think, the way, the way you called it. And uh, as we operate, we often find ourselves in, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in that context. And what we tend to see is that uh, this tends to create a, a stagnation uh, around the political process because uh, the sides feel more or less comfortable uh, uh, with that situation. The alternative, as you put it, is, is worse. Uh, very often, uh, uh, we lack uh, the, the uh, 
um, uh, the leverage that is needed to push them uh, to make progress towards uh, a, a long-term uh, resolution of the conflict. So what we see emerging is the dynamics to which Fred was, was referring to very often. Uh, you see an increasing uh, uh, radicalization, a radical na nationalism emerging on, uh, on the ground. Uh, in some cases, organized crime or uh, 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 very weak economic governance in, in any way, which becomes then ingrained in this, in this protracted, uh, uh, protracted situation. And, uh, um, and the problem we have is to find different angles. Inclusiveness. Inclusiveness has been, uh, I think, the, the dominant theme of the last presentation is something which I believe uh, is extremely important uh, uh, to move a negotiation process forward. However, uh, one of the obstacles we do find is, uh, is exactly the attitude of governments. This, after all, it's an intergovernmental organization. Though, so as, as you discuss this, uh, we, we have to deal with, uh, with governments or with uh, unrecognized authorities in some cases. But this doesn't matter. They, they always want, in a way, uh, to uh, control the process and to determine who should be part of uh, uh, of, uh, um, of the process of the engagement uh, uh, that we are, we are involved in. So how, how do we get out of that? How do we, we see even resistance to reconciliation in some cases, uh, because this would uh, uh, open up uh, avenues that would lead then to engagement of, uh, of different actors. And we made of reconciliation an important theme, I think, in all throughout our security days. But then this, uh, there is a kind of a perverse logic in all this. So in the end, we tend, uh, we tend to do what Fred once again was saying. We tend to do conflict prevention uh, uh, along conflict resolution and to settle with that, for, a, for settling for a, uh, for a lower level of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of intervention, making sure that situation doesn't deteriorate. But even that, on the long term, may become non-sustainable. So how do we get out of this, of this negative uh, circle. Anybody? Okay. Um, sorry. No, I think an, an important part of getting out of these uh, kind of S5 situations is indeed the role that mediators and other outside parties can play in encouraging the parties to reframe the problem. Uh, in, in many of the conflicts that are stuck in these kind of protracted conflicts, um, we find, again, another theme which I've written some about and, and Professor Zartman has published a book about it as well, uh, the, the distinction between backward and forward looking approaches to conflict resolution. Um, so often in these conflicts, everyone is focused on the past. Who caused this conflict? They did. You know, as each party points at the other and holds the other responsible for it. And therefore, we can't do anything until they do something. And therefore, both sides sit there, you know, and, and they use my least favorite diplomatic uh, metaphor, uh, the ball is in the other side's court uh, from tennis. The ball is always in the other side's court. It's up to them uh, to serve before I do anything. Um, and because they're not looking at the future, they also fail to see potential uh, mutually hurting situations in, in the future, potential cliffs that they could fall off of. But more importantly also, they, they fail to find the mutually enticing opportunities. Uh, in so many conflict situations, uh, most people are hurting very seriously, but often governments are not, and people in governments are not. Um, the economic conditions are often very poor, uh, but generally the poverty of a lot of our societies, and even in Europe, uh, is not felt by uh, the political elites and some of the economic elites. So for them it's not hurting, uh, but that doesn't mean that at the grassroots level and for most of the populations there's not a great deal of hurt. But there's also, even for the elites, not enough consideration of how might things be better? How can we improve the econ economy? How can we find uh, development? Uh, imagine for a moment, uh, I've spent some time looking at the South Caucasus. Imagine that there were economic integration in the South Caucasus instead of barriers for trade and, and economic exchange among the countries of the region uh, and between them and Turkey and Russia. 
um, as an alternative. And so part of the role, I think, of the, of the outsiders is, is to try to identify and encourage parties to reframe the situation and to try to encourage them to look at, you know, the future rather than just focusing on the past. One cannot, of course, forget the past, but if the past dominates uh, and if simply getting revenge for past crimes uh, is all that states are focused on, we'll never get anywhere in conflict resolution and reconciliation. We have to look to the future and we have to constantly ask parties, how could things be better in this region if, in fact, we resolve the conflicts that are preventing us from moving forward? Anybody else? Do you want to say something? Otherwise, there's a question there. Yeah, uh, Ambassador. Can, can I ask all, speak, all uh, uh, people who ask for questions to introduce themselves uh, since uh, we have a... Thank you, uh, Secretary General. Uh, Tajan Ildem, Ambassador of Turkey to the OSC. Uh, well, I think uh, the keynote uh, speech and uh, the following panel was uh, a very good way to kick off the discussion. Uh, I don't have any particular question, but uh, perhaps I would... Uh, emphasize the importance of political will in uh, uh, resolution of conflicts. Uh, uh, we are not here perhaps to tackle uh, specific uh, conflicts, uh, but I was uh, uh, tempted to also uh, uh, raise the issue of creation of a uh, common destiny for the generations to come. Uh, speakers referred to uh, a generation, I, I think it was Professor Tanner uh, referring to 20 years of conflicts and a generation uh, growing up with uh, the existence of uh, certain realities on the ground. Uh, and it requires us to bring about new ideas, new aspirations for the future. And I think such ideas would also be instrumental in triggering the political will, which is in most cases missing. Uh, uh, since uh, uh, the keynote uh, speech was uh, referring to the Cyprus question, for instance, I think it was quite a good incentive uh, to tie the resolution of the conflict to the membership in the European Union. And I think we can uh, develop as many uh, 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 examples as this one uh, to trigger uh, the political will. Take, for instance, the Caucasus. If we can generate ideas on how to better integrate the peoples of uh, the uh, South Caucasus uh, with uh, large-scale infrastructure projects to tie them together, it would be an enormous advantage uh, for uh, uh, the parties to the conflict to think about seriously how to reach a, a settlement, a polit uh, the conflict resolution. I think this is the key. Uh, political will is necessary, and I very much uh, agree that civil society, think tanks, uh, uh, those ideas out of the box should be generated. One word uh, that on uh, uh, women, uh, gender uh, in peace and security, since uh, uh, Turkey is among uh, the four uh, participating states uh, uh, co-sponsoring uh, a decision that we hopefully can take uh, in Kiev this year, because we were unsuccessful uh, last year, it is extremely important to make sure that whatever we have as commitments, and we are not only targeting 1325 in that sense, it is a broader issue, uh, we need to ensure that every organization, including the OSC, can be helpful in implementing these commitments. Uh, my country is not uh, in the forefront of uh, uh, gender questions uh, with its record, but we earnestly believe that we can bring a difference if in international uh, fora we can generate uh, ideas 
to better uh, uh, implement the already existing uh, commitments. So I, my only question would be perhaps uh, if our uh, speakers on the panel can uh, uh, talk about uh, political will uh, and uh, the conflict resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anybody care to comment? Uh, I think that there are a couple of uh, um, very interesting thoughts in this. Uh, for instance, how also to encourage political will uh, through economic uh, incentives. So the political will has to be also, in a way, nurtured. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll take on the political will question. And I have to say, no disrespect to the very interesting question, I find political will sometimes can be a rather nebulous concept that doesn't necessarily help us because it moves away from the individual responsibility of leaders by presenting something rather more abstract. So I would rather look at who are the individual political leaders who could have chosen to support peace rather than war, um, rather than talking about a general lack of political will. And I think the role of uh, countries, but also inter the international community generally, could be in praising leaders who choose to unblock frozen conflicts and I think the great contemporary example of our time is Myanmar. And there you see a set of incentives uh, to a political leader, Nobel Prizes, um, international recognition, a place in history, and compared to political leaders who choose not to support peace or choose to remain trapped within uh, uh, the dynamics of a frozen conflict, who will soon be forgotten. I think there's also in terms of unpacking political will, looking actually at the direct benefits that political leaders are receiving from conflict. And in many cases, I think in relation to the, the answer that was already provided here, um, it's not, uh, sadly, it's the case that there are great political benefits, be they economic linked to war economies, as was the case for many political leaders in the Balkans who were certainly profiting from a situation of lawlessness um, and lack of political will at that time, of course. Um, or there may be political benefits in terms of uh, populist uh, stimulus of support. And on frozen conflicts, just a note on perhaps contradicting what I've just said about inclusiveness. There are, of course, many examples where an attempt has been made to involve civil society in order to unblock a conflict and this has not necessarily been successful. Cyprus has already been mentioned, but the UNDP put in great efforts to bring civil society into the peace process in order to stimulate and change uh, the dynamics there. And this, unfortunately, had limited impact. So I think it's worth exploring where that strategy doesn't work and why. Um, in addition, if we look at the South Caucasus, in many of the conflicts in the region there, there are similarly frozen processes of civil society involvement. I think we, what we might call frozen dialogue and peace processes, as well as at the, the, the lack of results at governmental level. I think the answer may be perhaps in bringing together some of these different processes so that they actually have an effect and an impact on each other. And I know the next session looks at questions of process design, so we'll probably... Uh, the how, the tools, so we'll probably consider some of these issues in more detail. And finally, on 1325, absolutely uh, support the suggestion made that the OSCE and I think other international organizations can be acting as a hub of support and expertise to member states. In Brussels, we work very closely with the European Union's task force on implementation of 1325. Uh, which is still a rather embryonic forum, but would ideally be a hub for the member states to then be learning from each other, from sharing experience, from being supported by that international uh, organization in order to further their own implementation. And this may be perhaps a role for the OSCE in this area. And I know its own work on 1325 has been very impressive so far. Uh, so is perhaps playing this role for the state parties. So, so the question to all of you is, should the OSCE make an effort to try to include more actors 
in uh, processes towards conflict resolution. How do we do that? Including civil society, including uh, youth. The issue of youth has been brought up. I think that's, that's an important one, especially as we look at protracted conflicts where you see young generations coming up uh, and uh, being somehow limited in their vision by the presence of the conflict. And, and we need to help them out. We need uh, to help them look at the future. That's where you know, the young generations have an, added, uh, have an added value. They can help us look, look ahead. But we need, uh, we need to create new ways to, uh, to interact with them, to bring them out. So what, what can be done by the OSC uh, to move things in this direction? Suggestions, comments? Well, again, I think one of the strengths of the OSCE has been the presence of missions on the ground, particularly in local areas, and therefore the ability to have contact and work with civil society uh, in many cases. Uh, I, I want to make a distinction, though, about civil society. There are different kinds. I mean, we talk about it as if it's one and the same thing everywhere, uh, but there are civil society organizations that are very nationalistic or ethnocentric, and there are those that are multinational, multi-ethnic, and that attempt to bridge gaps. Um, my colleague at Brown, uh, Ashutosh Varshini, has done an extensive study of conflict in cities in India uh, between uh, Muslims and Hindus. And he finds that in cities which experience very little conflict, there is a large degree of, of inter-ethnic uh, bridging civil society organizations, whereas in the cities that have experienced a great deal of inter-ethnic conflict, and there are a number in India, uh, often with large-scale death, um, the civil society is organized around nationalistic lines, and I think we find the same in many parts of the OSCE region as well. Um, I've certainly encountered some uh, in, in, in various regions of conflict where I've you know, tried to examine in some detail uh, what, the, what the OSCE is doing. Um, so, I mean, we need to w reach out to civil society, but we also need to recognize that in some cases, civil society can be part of the problem as well as part of the solution. Um, and that uh, we need particularly to identify those civil society actors that are really willing to, uh, to work across uh, ethnic and, and national lines and, and that do not take uh, a very, very strong kind of nationalistic orientation uh, that, if anything, encourages political leaders or, in some cases, again, you know, political leaders create supportive civil society which then makes it difficult for political leaders when they want to make a deal, and I can think of several cases in this region even involving some of the so-called frozen conflicts uh, where political leadership seemed to be prepared finally to make concessions and then felt entrapped by their own civil society, uh, which they had in some sense created through their own rhetoric uh, attacking the other party. So, I mean, these are complex issues, but again, we need to be able to differentiate and make some of these, these subtle distinctions. In the end, though, I mean, political will is, is I mean, it's, it is a vague concept, uh, but in the end, the organization is what the states make of it, um, and it can be an effective organization that, that really uh, is able to reach out to the grassroots, um, or it can become a talking shop here in Vienna, and that's up to the states to decide. Um, I clearly have my preferences of which way it ought to go, um, but um, the choice is, is yours, not mine. Um, I think uh, the state's parties, the participating states, you know, need to make some critical decisions here as well about how seriously they're going to undertake uh, the commitments uh, that they have made since 1975, um, freely and, and openly, um, but whether they're actually going to take them seriously and implement them. And, and that is, in some sense, of course, I think the kind of political will that is needed uh, is, is to actually carry out uh, to a large degree, what, what you've already done. Thank you. Just to um, add one point about political will, and I'm, I'm grateful about the question of the Turkish ambassador here, uh, is, of course, political will needs pressure from within. And, and that, of course, in, involves uh, possibly uh, what uh, Professor Sartman referred to as reframing. Reframing a conflict, perhaps look much more from the development side, empowerment, of certain groups uh, on a local level, uh, perhaps a human security dimension, much more than looking at the stalemate itself. So reframing, but also the issue of accountability, responsibility, and as has been mentioned, leadership too. Leadership can make a big difference in these conflict resolutions. Uh, and finally, political will is not enough. What is need needed as well is resources, resources for those uh, who have to actually carry out the operations 
being the OSCE, or also resources, of course, on the ground of those committed to uh, make a peaceful change. Please. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, David Gorman with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Um, an issue of inclusivity. Um, what I find now is that increasingly parties do recognize that there needs to be much more inclusivity in a peace process. Um, <clears throat> and, and I find also on the side of, of insurgents, <clears throat> they increasingly recognize that there needs to be some type of process of democratic validation, which was the, uh, the terms used in Northern Ireland and which we used to some uh, good effect in, in, in the Southern Philippines when trying to talk to, uh, through the uh, more Islamic Liberation Front about the need for uh, them to be more inclusive. Um, and, I, and I think what we find now increasingly is that groups on both sides of the table realize that they can't just have a deal among them in a closed room with um, cigars and, and expect that somehow this is going to be uh, agreed upon by everybody like it was in, the, in perhaps the, the good old days or not. And so they do recognize that. And on the other side of the equation, I think people also are very much demanding uh, a place at the table. But the question now, I think, has really evolved to how and why and which and who and, and, and what. And, and why, to start with, in the sense of, I think the parties need to understand, you need to have that conversation, and with the communities, why, in fact, we are including civil society. And then the who, who are we including when we say civil society? Which groups from civil society? How they should be, um, uh, how they should be included? Um, what role should they have? When should they come in? And so on and so forth. And I found that um, in, in the Philippines and, and now other processes, um, we need to be a little bit more strategic in how we uh, develop an inclusive process um, beyond just recognizing the need for it. And the second uh, point I wanted to make or, or question is the role of uh, social media when it comes to inclusivity. And what we found, um, obviously, in, in the Middle East, uh, I was in, in Libya throughout much of 2011, and uh, of course, in, in the, in very much in, in, in East Asia, is uh, the role of social media, where people are forcing their way to the table uh, through social media, despite our efforts to, to try to keep them out, uh, through Facebook, through blogs, through Twitter, and what have you. Um, and yet, while on the one hand, it's, it seemed to be a, a encouraging development in the sense that another voice has emerged that's getting their voice heard. On the other hand, as, as one of my colleagues commented, I wish I could take credit for it, uh, she said, we don't know, in fact, who is at the table now. The social media is now making comments, uh, inserting themselves into the process, but we don't know who they are. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know who they represent, and we don't know uh, how responsible they will, in fact, be. But they are a player, and I don't know how this is emerging in in, um, in, um, in, in, in the OSC uh, region, but uh, this is something I wanted to, uh, two points I wanted to pose to the uh, panelists. Thank you very much. Right. Well, as David knows, I've been looking a little bit at Mindanao uh, for the last couple of years, and uh, one of the interesting things about the peace process here, it, is, it seems to me that the OSCE might learn from uh, is indeed the ceasefire monitoring mechanism that was set up on Mindanao, uh, again, under the leadership of an international monitoring team led by Malaysia, but particularly a very, very large network called the Civilian Protection Component made up of local NGOs and CSOs that operate throughout the island. Um, in, in this case, people in small villages with cell phones uh, acting as a kind of a network to report incidents that might lead to violence, um, reporting on... on the compliance with and getting the various parties who engaged in violence uh, to try to return to their barracks, for example, or whatever. Um, but it was, it's a great example, I think, in this case, of the use of civil society uh, in a very constructive way uh, under, again, a kind of international leadership and international mandate um, coming essentially from the Organization for Islamic Cooperation uh, through Malaysia. Uh, but uh, again, at, at multiple levels to try to, to try to maintain the peace process. And this was across lines. This was across lines. But I mean, these are mostly local citizens in the region affected by conflict, but through the mechanism they maintain contact both in, in the case, uh, in this case with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Philippines Army. And uh, there is also a joint consultative committee of the two 
that, that meets on a regular basis and that can be contacted any time that there's any uncoordinated military activities. The whole idea was, again, to avoid any kind of confrontation, accidental, incidental, or whatever, of the military forces. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, the other problem David refers to, of course, is what we know in the, in the academic literature is a spoiler problem. Um, there are spoilers everywhere. Um, spoilers are people who profit in one way or another from the conflict or who are dissatisfied with the outcome of the, of, of the conflict. Uh, and unfortunately, in Mindanao, of course, in the last few days, we've seen uh, precisely the consequences of the spoiler problem as well, uh, when a party that, who felt left out, namely uh, Nermaswari, uh, whom you know well, um, uh, was uh, not really included in the peace process, uh, having been the principal party in a 1996 peace process that collapsed, uh, was largely excluded from the recent peace process. We have these dilemmas then about who do we include and who don't we include. Uh, there are some people who may be so destructive that including them will make it impossible to arrive at an agreement. Uh, there are others uh, who need to be brought in because if they're not brought in, they can destroy the agreement once it's reached. And, and this is a very, very difficult dilemma and, and one on which we need a good deal more research. I mean, we've clearly identified this as a key problem. But again, how do we tell the difference between who needs to be brought in and can be brought in uh, and buy into the peace process and, 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 and who maybe in some cases needs to be excluded, but how do we exclude them in ways that they cannot then disrupt a peace process that, that emerges without them? It's a, it's a big issue. It's one we confront in almost every conflict or every, every peace negotiation that I've ever looked at at least, certainly uh, in the OSCE region. Uh, there will always be people um, in some cases, people who have financial interests, uh, in other cases, people who have political interests uh, in trying to undermine the process. Um, and they need to be managed. And the techniques for managing them are complex, extremely complex, uh, and something that we really need to study seriously. Yes, if I may come in briefly, I think those um, questions that you pose, I mean, the why, the who, and the how, of inclusion are crucial, but all, of course, entirely context-specific, and taking us back to the need for uh, in-depth analysis of context in order to, I think, answer any of those in a sensible way. So I won't attempt to do that here. I wanted to just come back to the question of the role of the OSCE here in terms of promoting inclusiveness. And so the discussion so far I think the, the, the approach set out in your paper of trying to identify comparative advantages is an interesting and useful one. And to be slightly provocative, I think we could probably say that a comparative disadvantage is the intergovernmental nature of the organization, perhaps when it comes to the negotiation phase. Because in terms of widening inclusion, it's always going to be rather politically difficult. However, a comparative advantage may lie in the long-term work that the organization does, particularly in questions of rule of law and institution building. And they're trying to promote an inclusive approach. I think there's a lot of potential. I know there'll be a discussion tomorrow on infrastructures for peace, which is uh, perhaps a promising way to look at institution building in post-conflict settings which has become something rather technical and outsider-driven and I think needs to be revived. Um, a key for us is the World Development Report, as has already been mentioned by one of the first speakers, how to build institutions that provide citizens with justice, security and jobs. And that lies in generating a healthy relationship between states and societies, bringing civil society into those institution building processes and um, not separating, separating support to governments on the one hand and support to civil society on the other, but bringing the two together so that all support to governments has accountability to society built into it. Um, and I just throw that out uh, as perhaps an area where the OSCE may have a lead in terms of promoting inclusion um, as opposed to the negotiation stage where perhaps uh, it, it has a comparative disadvantage, mm -hmm. if I may put it like that. Right. And there is one angle, by the way, it occurred to me as, as you were uh, describing this as an intergovernmental organization, which I did myself, but there is one mode of operation of the OSCE that is not necessarily intergovernmental, and that is its uh, parliamentary dimension. We have a parliamentary assembly. 
And uh, we've been working, I think, over the years to try also to bring it closer to the intergovernmental side, to increase, in a way, the synergies. And perhaps there is room to, uh, uh, to work more on that and to look at how the, the parliamentary uh, dimension of the OSC can act as a complementary tool supporting the intergovernmental side uh, to engage in a different way, in a different man manner, but, but moving in the same direction, supporting the same uh, processes. Uh, I see Professor Hartmann. Uh, Chartman. If you want to join us on the, on the panel, Professor, feel free. No, I had a question, not an answer. Oh, you're quite, oh right. <laughs> okay. I'd like to go back to the idea of uh, political will as a starting point and then uh, go off to a particular question. Uh, I agree with Ms. Willard that <laughs> we end up in political will and, and, and it becomes a, 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 a dead end where they don't have political will. Oh, well, what are we going to do about it? And I disagree in the sense that uh, we should be asking ourselves when we get to that point, so why don't they have a political will? Uh, what is it that we could uh, do which would change the desire of one side or the other? And that leads me to uh, a recognition, uh, I'm suggesting that there are situations where you can't get around an absence of political will where, uh, in terms that I talked about earlier, where you just can't make the conflict hurt uh, to at least one of the parties. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, uh, examples from my, uh, the, my, my text for this uh, comes from two cases, one in your area and the other outside. One is Nagorno-Karabakh and the other is Western Sahara. Uh, <clears throat> the problem, I think, in both cases analytically is that the demandeur uh, at the same time uh, is perfectly fat and happy. Uh, and there's no way of getting them to be hurting from the situation. I'm talking specifically about Algeria and about uh, Azerbaijan. Both of them are the demandeur. They don't like the situation, the informal situation which exists on the ground. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there, uh, we can come up with the idea of a development community. That was, uh, uh, my colleague has mentioned that in, in regard to South Caucasus. It's a wonderful idea. Reframe it in development terms in North Africa, in South Caucasus. But what do Azerbaijan and uh, uh, what do Algeria care about it? They're perfectly fat and happy by themselves. Uh, and the party in the other side uh, that is demandeur in regard to uh, economic integration uh, is the other side, uh, Armenia and, and Morocco, both of which could benefit from uh, cooperation in their region. So my question is, and my suggestion is, uh, that there may be situations where uh, uh, unhappy though we may be about the continuing conflict, uh, the efforts might be better uh, uh, focused on not destabilizing an informal situation. What can we do? What can an organization such as the OSCE do so that this informal uh, uh, continuing conflict uh, doesn't get out of hand by one side who decides to go for broke uh, and uh, upset what is an informal balance? Uh, rather than what can we do to actually resolve the, the conflict. Uh, certainly one advantage, one difference between the two situations is that uh, the South Caucasus are, are members of uh, an organization, in yours, as I understand it. Whereas uh, it, in North Africa, uh, they are they're members of organizations, but the organizations are paralyzed by uh, by their conflict. So one way uh, of uh, helping not destabilize uh, is to uh, in, uh, involve an institution, an institutional membership that would help the, the parties. Are there other things that can be done to, rather than resolve the conflict, help the parties not destabilize an informal uh, uh, situation? <laughs> at the risk of replying to my next door neighbor um, you know I mean there, there clearly are things that one can do but one also of course runs into what we might call the Cyprus problem again I mean stable situations have provide no incentive to negotiate a solution um, and so sometimes stability alone is not a, a sufficient goal 
Uh, but there are things I think that one can do in a couple of cases at least to perhaps increase confidence and maybe at least reduce the risk that these situations will, will somehow unfreeze in the wrong direction, uh, which we saw happen uh, in, in South Ossetia, uh, in, in Georgia uh, in 2008, and, and, and subsequently, of course, in Abkhazia as well. Um, I mean, for example, in, uh, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, we have, again, the line of contact with the two armies facing one another uh, within 100 meters or so of one another in, uh, in many cases. Um, and there are incidents, 20 or so people a year, I gather, getting killed. Um, that's not on the grand scale of war a major problem, but it still is a problem that could easily lead to escalation. If as a first step confidence building measure one could get these armies to withdraw and perhaps put in some kind of peacekeeping or a, or a much larger, uh, stronger uh, monitoring force at least uh, to encourage withdrawal, and if, as a result of that, one could begin to develop confidence that the international community is willing to commit itself to provide peace and security wherever the line is drawn in subsequent negotiations, this might then begin to build the confidence for a longer-term solution. In other words, I think we can stabilize some situations uh, as, as a first step leading towards a longer-term solution. Now, ultimately, you can't do too much, frankly, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, because the critical issue is the status question, and the status question, the solution of the status question prejudges most of the other issues. But the withdrawal of the, of, of the forces on the line of contact is not one of those situations. And, and their direct confrontation on the line of contact uh, so far has led to a dangerous situation, but not an explosive situation. But it could explode. Uh, and, and there are things, I think, that we can do in cases like that, uh, in the short term at least, to make it less likely that these kinds of of situations uh, will explode. And, and we need to look for those kinds of, of openings um, and recognize that uh, even partial steps uh, may be helpful in a number of cases. Um, uh, yes, just uh, very briefly to come in on that. At, at risk of sounding rather abstract myself, I think it's about identifying a combination of incentives, sanctions, and conditions that work in that particular case. And so the, you, you raised the, the point about Azerbaijan, and clearly um, the economic situation, the economic growth within the country means that certain types of economic conditionality are unlikely to work, but there may be other ways to put pressure on the country. I mean, certain... Uh, inclusion in international fora, respect, high-level visits are all talked about as ways to influence in the absence of financial incentives. However, the other part of the question that actually containing violence may be key. I, earlier, I was rather dismissive and negative about the ongoing peace processes in the South Caucasus, including the civil society managed dialogues and the various confidence-building measures. But I think you could certainly make the case that all of that confidence-building that has gone on for 10 years, while it has not resolved the conflicts, has drastically reduced the level of violence, of course, and also the potential and the risk of violence, arguably, although some say that that may be unblocked at any time. And I think the question for us is the famous counterfactual of would the situation have been worse without those measures and those efforts and that level of engagement with Azerbaijan in a sense uh, or any of the governments of the region if we're talking about hard pressure which some of our civil society counterparts in Azerbaijan argue for a tougher approach well actually maintaining this level of engagement is arguably one thing that's also keeping that uh, as a stable situation and Briefly on the question of Parliament, as this was raised, if I may simply say a, a short word. Um, with, in this question of building accountable institutions, which is one thing the OSCE has, of course, been involved in, and I think should be rethinking along with everybody in light of the World Development Report, but new evidence on what works and what doesn't work in institution building, I talked about accountability to civil society, but of course accountability to parliament uh, when supporting governments, building in accountability mechanisms, not just those that create accountability to society, but uh, statutory bodies, court of auditors and parliaments. And perhaps there's a role there for the parliamentary assembly 
and in, I think in many transition countries, one of the key missing pieces has been uh, parliaments playing an active role in development. So, for instance, the lack of functioning parliamentary committees that monitor budget, look at expenditure, etc., is highly problematic. And um, that the, the caliber and quality of uh, individuals in parliament in order to play that accountability role. Um, I have to say I'm no longer particularly familiar with the OSCE as my focus is exclusively the European Union. Um, so I'm not sure how far those kind of issues have advanced in terms of the parliamentary assembly's role. Yes. that work now? Still not? Okay. Recommendations by Professor Thierry Hopman. What actually should be done now to de-escalate and create risk reduction measures in the area? And actually the two reasons why I think it's, it's, uh, it's really very urgent now. Uh, and it's uh, actually, I don't think it's just a dangerous situation. It's, it becomes an explosive situations for two reasons. One is there is a clear militarization going on in the region militarization in terms of arms race, building up, but also preparing rapid uh, strikes, etc., uh, which of course do not just have economic consequences for the region, but also uh, is leading to uh, some kind of possible brinkmanship, which could lead to war. And the second one is, is, is the, the conflict in the Middle East, particularly with regard to Syria. Some, uh, an analyst recently referred to Syria as a a Florida sinkhole, uh, which may not be really fair, but it has reverberations well beyond the region, and there are now population movements, uh, refugees from the region into the Caucasus. And that is another very dangerous development where urgency is really required to do some things. I think these frozen conflicts need urgent attention uh, because otherwise it really could, could escalate. We have now the question there in the back. Yes, thank you. Microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a representative uh, of, uh, of the delegation of the Republic of Azerbaijan to the OEC. Uh, I, I would like uh, to make uh, some uh, general comments uh, with regard to the uh, applicability of um, civil society efforts uh, and the efforts of the governments uh, uh, to the specific situations uh, in the OEC region. Uh, we all know that uh, conflicts uh, differ uh, with regard to their uh, essence uh, as there might be social conflicts and the conflicts uh, between the uh, countries. Uh, and the, more or less, uh, the role of the civil society, the uh, media representatives, uh, might, uh, might be helpful with regard to the, uh, somehow to having, uh, to find the re resolution to the social conflicts, uh, internal conflicts uh, within the countries. And uh, at the same time, uh, the role of uh, governments the role of international organizations uh, is uh, somehow uh, crucial uh, with regard to the conflicts uh, uh, affecting the countries. I mean, uh, where there is a, uh, an aggression uh, to the uh, territorial integrity and uh, there is a, a, a clashes between the two countries or three countries. In this case, uh, we should uh, find uh, a basis uh, for the uh, resolution of those conflicts. Uh, and we have actually uh, the basis for this, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the international law, the principles of international law. And at the same time, uh, within the Organization uh, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, there is a Helsinki Final Act. Uh, and that at the same time, uh, the organizations uh, 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 somehow uh, uh, done, done its effort, uh, efforts uh, uh, as a mandate uh, from the uh, United Nations as a regional organization. And there are 
uh, certain uh, uh, tasking uh, from the Security Council uh, resolutions uh, with regard to the resolution uh, uh, of the conflicts. In this case, we should uh, find a basis, uh, what might be a basis for the resolution. And I would like uh, to hear the views of the distinguished speakers uh, and also, also the keynote speaker, Mr. Tartman, with regard to the, what might be the basis uh, for the conflicts uh, uh, between uh, two countries. Uh, as we know, uh, that they should be uh, uh, solution uh, and that there are actually the basis for it and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, have a basis which was established in the beginnings uh, of uh, 19s and there are uh, taskings uh, to the mediation efforts and to the mediation institutions. Uh, we should uh, somehow assess the process and uh, uh, to have uh, a clear vision what, uh, what might be done in this regard. And uh, with regard to the uh, economic uh, uh, pressures uh, to the sides, uh, uh, we know that uh, in, in every region, uh, call it the Northern Africa or South Caucasus, uh, there are uh, certain uh, countries uh, which uh, somehow uh, the economic pressure uh, might be helpful uh, for these countries. Uh, at the same time, they should uh, somehow uh, take uh, uh, advantage uh, uh, of the situation existing and they don't, they don't uh, somehow uh, want uh, to change the, uh, the situation, existing situation. Uh, and the, with regard to the, uh, they, there were some comments with regard to the withdrawal of uh, troops uh, 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 by distinguished speaker. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, the uh, I will call from, uh, from, uh, from my side, uh, the troops uh, situated in the line of contact, I mean, from, uh, from, uh, from the side of Azerbaijan, they, they cannot uh, withdraw uh, from their positions because uh, this is the territory. Uh, and the, from the other side, uh, they, uh, they, they might be some withdrawal uh, because uh, those troops uh, came to these territories uh, uh, as a result of the conflict. And uh, somehow we, we should uh, find a solution based on international law, uh, what might be the uh, efforts uh, with regard to somehow uh, not fully withdrawal, uh, to have a withdrawal, but uh, just to keep uh, away from the line of contact. Uh, uh, and uh, in general, uh, other further efforts uh, to have uh, full uh, withdrawal of the troops. Uh, I would like to hear uh, uh, the comments of the distinguished speaker in this regard. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I have another question there, and then uh, we will wrap up. I'll give the floor to our speakers and to Professor Tsartman, if he wishes to reply. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, David Knezian, Permanent Mission of Armenia. Uh, uh, what is interesting uh, for me in your presentations, which were very valuable, thank you very much for the presentations, uh, it was the, uh, the various ideas which I united in my mind uh, in one, under one word, democratization. You spoke about gender issues, about uh, implementation of human rights, and uh, I, I came to that thought that maybe the, the process of democracy building in the uh, conflict areas with inclusion of all stake stakeholders would be the uh, best way to uh, find, to pave the way for conflict resolution. And uh, I would like to hear the views of uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, on this idea of, idea of uh, democratization in the conflict zones and uh, uh, what, what tools and mechanisms uh, does OSCE have uh, under its disposal uh, to, uh, to promote uh, building of democracy in the conflict zones. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, final comments. Shall we go in the uh, reverse order? Uh, uh, Ms. Woolard, would you like to go first? Yes, just very briefly, I won't. I'm afraid, uh, as I'm uh, not so by no means an expert on the South Caucasus region, I won't answer some of the many interesting detailed questions. I think I'll just conclude with re reference to the principles that I outlined at the beginning that are principles that we support from a peace-building perspective. 
and that I understand to be the principles underlying the OSCE's work on conflict resolution. From our side, this includes inclusiveness, but then obviously as a civil society network, that is something that we would argue for uh, very clearly. I think what we hear in the discussion is a, a, a discussion about what happens when different principles come into conflict. And to return to one of the points made by the other speakers at the beginning, which parts of international law have precedence, which principles take precedence, are we still in an era where sovereignty trumps all else? Um, I would think not. Some of the other principles we've outlined are also considered um, equally as relevant. In terms of democratization, I think we're talking about uh, something similar, yes, that within any stage of conflict, looking at preventive action, negotiations, agreement, implementation of agreements, and then long-term peace building in conflict-affected countries, to be applying that range of principles that was set out, as that is something that's more likely, as likely to be more effective at preventing a return to conflict. Thank you. Again, let me emphasize and just follow up the point that, that uh, my colleague has just made here, that uh, international law and international norms provide guidance, but uh, there are clearly many norms and laws which are not always completely compatible, and there's no clear hierarchy among them. Um, and we cannot make one principle supreme over all the others, it seems to me. In the end, in conflict resolution, what really matters is that the parties in the conflict reach an agreement. And they will reach an agreement if they perceive that the benefits of that agreement, minus whatever it might cost them, exceeds the next best alternative. Uh, what, what Roger Fisher at Harvard calls the BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And at any stage in a peace process, in a negotiation process, a conflict resolution process, the parties are presumably comparing what they might get from an agreement with the next best alternative. And so what we need to do to resolve conflicts, it, it sounds easier than it is, of course, in practice, but what we need to do in the end is to convince the parties that an agreement will be better for all of the parties than their next best alternative. And we cannot uh, impose a single judicial decision. This is not a, a judicial body that can somehow, you know, make a legal decision and carry it out internationally. Uh, the United Nations occasionally tries to develop that capacity, but certainly uh, the, the, the uh, normative foundation of the OSE does not give it that kind of capacity to make a legal decision and then enforce that legal decision on, on the participating states. Um, what we have to do is to promote a process in which this institution provides support in multiple ways uh, through mediation, through assistance to the parties and, and, and helping them recognize the benefits of agreement so that in the end, parties recognize that they're better off resolving these conflicts than they would be otherwise. Um, and that's the solution to, it seems to me, the problems of, of Nagorno-Karabakh, of Georgia, uh, of, of Transnistria and Moldova, as well as you know, all of the other conflicts that exist in this region. Again, this is hard to do and it takes time. It requires reframing, it requires rethinking the process. It requires new thinking, if you like, to borrow uh, Mr. Gorbachev's phrase. Um, and we need a lot more new thinking, uh, but we need to think about ways in which we can, can, can raise up somehow the common interests uh, so that they somehow are perceived by the parties, and again, Professor Zartman's emphasis on perception here is key, so that they are perceived by the parties as providing them with a better future than the alternative. Thank you. Well, I learned a lot from this uh, debate, and uh, of course, we don't have a silver bullet uh, here, but I think we have to, to work on, on, on uh, these uh, very interesting suggestions. And again, I think to, to come to the, the questions here, uh, the OEC actually has, I think, uh, all the necessary norms. It has the toolbox for these conflict managements, for the democratization issues. It just, they just need to be applied in a coherent and sustained fashion. It needs political will. Uh, we have discussed that. We need to unpack political will a little bit more. It needs resources, too, and needs space to be given 
for the actors who actually are mandated to work with the parties uh, on the ground. And finally, information sharing and dialogue uh, is very much the key. If, if information does not flow, if dialogue is not engaged, it will be very hard to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you. So we've come to the conclusion uh, of this panel. Uh, of this panel, I would like to thank uh, the panelists and the public and Professor Zartman, of course, for his uh, introductory keynote presentation. I think we've had uh, a number of interesting uh, uh, comments and uh, suggestions, issues coming up. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of material that I'm sure will uh, come up again uh, at the subsequent sessions as, you, as we look in more detail into various uh, segments of this uh, of this discussion. There are some fundamental issues out there. Among the many, I could uh, select the one of, uh, uh, of the national sovereignty and uh, you know, is there a justification in terms of uh, uh, stability and security of the larger community uh, to, to argue that there should be certain limitations to national sovereignty and uh, you know, how do countries feel about that? So that in itself is it's a very current issue as, uh, as you see on the front pages of the newspapers in many, in many respects. Uh, but so thank you very much for your contribution. I look forward to a lively discussion for the rest of the day. We got a coffee break until a quarter to 12. Thank you.